Jerry's been putting this on about marvels of engineering on the seller website, and we're not going to read it in detail, but it does. The, the current, or the last chapter that I hadn't gone over was about bridges, and there's five different basic types of bridges, and they're huge bridges, like the Brooklyn Bridge was a marvel of engineering in its day. Um, here's the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel, which is 17 miles long across the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, uh, there were iron bridges that were famous. Um, the Brooklyn Bridge is, is actually very interesting. If someone wanted to, was looking for a project to talk about the building of the Brooklyn Bridge, although this wasn't the first time they did it, but um, the foundation of the Brooklyn Bridge, they started out with a uh, essentially putting some stone on the on the on the uh, floor of the river, and then they had little locks where people could go down. They ran compressed air, um, so the people would be working and digging out and taking the dirt out, and the the caisson, which was the foundation, would just sink further and further into the mud as they dug out underneath it. But as it got deeper and deeper, they had to go up in pressure with the compressed air until they actually got to pressures where when they were breathing air, which is in the 1880s or whatever, they, when they were building this, uh, they would, when they came back up, they would get the bends. You know, anybody know what the bends are? If you're a scuba diver, you get nitrogen dissolved in your blood, and if you come up too fast, it nucleates out, and your blood, blood turns to foam and you die, okay? Uh, so divers, scuba divers, have to stop midway up if they go on a 200-foot dive. Um, they have to stop part way up. I'm not a scuba diver, but something, you know, maybe 100 feet, and just stay there for about five minutes to let the nitrogen get out of their blood so they don't come all the way up. And it turns out the guy who was in charge, the engineer who was in charge of this, actually ended up getting the bends. He didn't die from it, but he was ill for the next 30 years from it. Anyway, um, there's a lot of interesting bridges. This looks sort of like the Bunker Hill Bridge, but it's not. It's a bigger cable stayed bridge. Um, just talking about any one of those bridge designs, the cable stayed bridge is, is an interesting design. I got a tour of the big dig back in 2001, and uh, they have to basically pull those strands within about a quarter of an inch of being all at the same length. Otherwise, you have too much stress on one of the, one of the strands of the wire rope and the others, you know, it snaps and then another one snaps. Then the next chapter on that, all that stuff is about railroads. These are large scale engineering tasks that people have done for a number of years, um, going all the way back to the, the pyramids uh, three or 4,000 years ago. The Great Wall of China, okay? Um, uh, the Chinese Canal, um, things going back thousands of years, but a lot more things more rapidly, we're having uh, more engineering feats of great complexity. Uh, just one of my favorite quotes from Oppenheimer, that the optimist thinks this is the best of all possible worlds, the pessimist fears, fears that it's true. And so sometimes people look at all these great marvels of engineering that we do, and they think this is wonderful. We sent someone to the moon. Um, the scientists take credit for it, but it's actually the engineers who did it. Um, now, they had to know a lot of science to, to do it, but the, the engineers actually built the rocket and things like that. The pessimist looks at these things and they, they're not so sure these are all good things. So um, that's one of the conflicts or the externalities. Uh, summary from last time, MIT exerts great leadership within engineering. As MIT so goes, so goes the nation in engineering. Um, I kind of showed you how MIT in, the, in 1865, when it started, um, helped define mechanical engineering, and then electrical engineering, and then metallurgy, and then chemical engineering, and then nuclear engineering, defined different disciplines of engineering, uh, where they would actually defined mechanical engineering, uh, because before that, there was only civil and mil military engineering. But even today, um, uh, 
although no other school would really admit it, um, uh, what MIT does sort of defines what other universities will do. I can give you a personal example. When I became department head in 1995, we were supposed to, on the list of the department strategy, we were supposed to hire someone in biomedical engineering. Well, at that time, biomedical engineering meant what I called a hip corroder. My thesis advisor and his thesis advisor had been hip corroders. A hip corroder is, you know, a metal hip, artificial hip you put in, and they would corrode. And they might fail within six months or a year or three years. I mean, when they first started putting them in people, they were, they were stainless steel and they were failing in six months. Well, you, you have an operation that you don't get off the crutches for six months and the thing fails and you need another operation. It's, you know, that wasn't very good. And I saw in my career as an undergraduate and then a graduate student, it go from about a one year or two year or three year lifetime to where they were starting to put artificial hips in children 10 years old and expecting them hopefully to last 30 years. Okay? Oh, yeah, they'd have to, well, they'd have to, do, well, I don't know exactly how they did it, but I remember it was a big deal when they started, when they thought they had enough longevity to do it, okay? Um, I don't know that they had to change size. Um, that's a good question. I never thought about that. I have to ask Bob Rose, but I remember what happened. Um, the other, in fact, we used to, well, I didn't do it, but people I was working with in the lab, they, we'd put a live rabbit on a little thumper, Okay, and it was just a little lazy Susan that would go around on the rabbit. We'd be strapped in there, and it would just pound on his hip, uh, pound on his foot to put an impact load on his hip. And then the, one of the graduate students in the same office with me, was he would then kill the rabbit, dissect the bone, and look at how the, molecular stru or the, the mechanical structure of the cellular bone had changed due to the impact loading. Okay, so beating on rabbit's feet, okay? Live rabbit's feet. Anyway. Um, but, so when I became a department head, I thought, eh, I don't need another hip corroder. They've been doing that for 30 years. And so I met with um, Doug Laufenberger, who's now head of the Department of Biomedical Engineering, which we didn't have at the time. And he had just come from Illinois. And we went to lunch and I said, what's interesting in bio biomedical engineer? I don't just want someone who looks at corrosion of metals in the human body. body. We've studied that for years. And he started telling me about soft tissue engineering. And I decided I wanted to hire a soft tissue engineer as our biomedical engineer. And it was not a traditional area of material science anywhere in the country. And in fact, the faculty in the department fought me for two years. I would bring in people who were in that area from other departments, not material science department. Where do you bring this person in for a faculty interview? And I said, look, you got you to gotta interview on the, in, on the fringes of the department. You don't just want to clone what you've already got. Uh, so we had that debate, but anyway, now biomedical engineering is a third of the department, okay? And in fact, within two or three years after other schools, after we hired our first couple of people, uh, this is uh, 20, 15, well, 17, 18 years ago, other departments in the country in material science, oh, MIT did that, we should do that, okay? And I could, I could go through other examples, but what we do influences other people. In fact, I'll give you another example um, in that 10 years ago, 12 years ago, we hired Chris Hsu, who called himself a metallurgist. Well, at the time, every, everybody else at MIT was saying, oh, we don't, metallurgy's dead. Ned Thomas, who was the last department head, oh, metallurgy, he was saying 15 years ago, metallurgy was dead. It's because he's a polymer person, because he was stupid, okay? I can't help him. I mean, metallurgy, if you take my material selection course, Metals are sold in much larger volume than anything else, okay? It may not be, well, you take, the, take the thing I explained why profitability in the metals industry was bad because productivity was going up very rapidly. That doesn't mean it's dead, but anyway. Um, uh, so when we hired uh, a metallurgist, all of a sudden within two or three years, other schools started hiring metallurgists, okay? Because everyone else would say, oh, metallurgy's dead, okay? So, um, and I could give you examples for MIT as a whole, too. But anyway, uh, the 20 greatest engineering achievements of the 20th century, the National Academy of Engineering came up with these 20 areas. 
And if you look at them, we've electrification, home appliances, the internet, they've greatly changed the way of life from what it was 100 years ago. Um, the 21st century challenges will have similar dramatic effects. That's things like making solar power economical. Uh, anyway, we've handed it out so far as that goes. Um, so we talked about what is engineering. We're going to continue. We've talked about what the difference is between science and engineering. We're going to give you some more on that today, uh, so far as that goes. Um, now, we talked about large-scale engineering pro uh, pyramid, uh, projects, like the pyramids. Um, when you ask a scientific question, you sometimes come up with interesting uh, answers. Uh, for example, when I first took over as an assistant professor here, the little short door 8137, as you walk around the corner, that was my office. And I shared it with a graduate student who was working on the fracture toughness of granite. This is a fracture toughness specimen being passed around. But um, no one had really kind of looked at the fracture toughness of granite. Why was he looking at it? Professor Backhoffen, who was a mechanical behavior person and taught mechanical properties of materials in course three, was interested because if you actually looked at and did some calculations on estimating the toughness of granite and other stones and stuff, there was no way to raise the Egyptian obelisk, okay? One of the engineering marvels in here is the Washington Monument, okay, which they actually built going straight up. But it had always been assumed that the Egyptians carved the stone because their obelisks were one monolithic piece of stone. The Washington Monument's a bunch of bricks, okay? But if you did the calculation, you would predict that the bending load would break the obelisk in two when you started to lift it up, okay? Well, but how do you do that without, you know, how do you get uniform support? And it would be, I mean, yeah, you probably could, I mean, but the thing's pretty heavy and, you know, they didn't have huge cranes. Well, it turns out... I'll assume mathematicians were correct. No, no, it, uh, the, the fracture mechanics of 1970, the best we knew about the details of fracture of, of uh, materials in stone said that you couldn't raise the Egyptian obelisk. So granite is a three-phase composite, silica feldspar and something else. You can look it up. I can't remember what the three types of rock are, but you can see the three colors, okay? It's speckled. So Wendell w Wilkening, Wendell W. Wilkening, WWW, before WWW meant something else, um, did his thesis, and that's one of his samples that he didn't test that I recovered. Um, and uh, he found that you get micro cracks at the tip of the crack, which gives significant toughening to composites, uh, stone composites, like a factor of five or ten higher toughness than everyone, anyone ever thought. So all of a sudden we can now understand how they lifted the Egyptian obelisk. They did just lift them up with a great big pulley and, and rope and everything. Um, but the science of fracture mechanics hadn't progressed. And then by the 1980s, the ceramists were saying, oh, we can make tough ceramics. And so they were going to make ceramic engines and all this other stuff. Uh, but it was, came out of kind of Al Backhoven's question of, well, how did they raise the obelisk, okay? Uh, which is a scientific question, okay? But it explained uh, some engineering uh, things. Um, so you can, start, you can start at engineering and you can talk about the huge scale projects like the, uh, the Egyptian pyramids or things. But you can also t uh, start with very simple things. And that's what... Has everyone gotten one of these bags? Anybody not gotten one? Okay, you want to pass, pass just one person? Okay, so here's, you don't have, well, you, you can pull it out, but people have written whole books and posted will be 26 pages from this book on the evolution of useful things by Henry Petrosky. Petrosky is a member of the National Academy of Engineering. He was a professor at Duke University, and he liked to write about the history of engineering. And what you're, you don't have to pull this out now, but you're welcome to. There's all kinds of paper clips. When I looked on Google, I had 400 pages. Need another one? Come up, you can come up and get one. Anybody else? Okay, he had 400 pages on paper clips, okay? 
So I bought some and I bought you some paper, these note cards. And what I'd like you to do, I mean, there are big paper clips. They're big and small. This one's got a little smiley face on it, okay? Um, so these are different designs. This one's got a little spring. This one is a, this is just a little, kind of like the spring one with the, uh, the arms on it. And you're gonna have a hard time figuring out how to, how to insert that. And we'll talk about that. You're missing a piece. Um, but that's the way they sell it. Um, there's an app, it has to have an application tool. And we might talk about it, but I'd like you to go home and look at these things. Uh, some of them are made of plastic, some of them are made of metal. And you can ask yourself whatever question you want. Uh, but I would like you to think about what makes paper clips, what makes a paper clip design a good design or a bad design. They come in all sizes and lots of shapes. There are a lot, mine here is a dollar sign. Some people probably have some music symbols um, that are paper clips. Um, and ask yourself, you can try clipping some paper together and see how well it works, okay? What are the mechanical properties of a paper clip that are, make it a good paper clip? Uh, it shouldn't be that hard for most of you to figure out, okay, if you had some undergraduate uh, mechanics course of some sort, okay? Huh? Which one did you say? That one. That one the, doesn't have all the pieces. You have to have an application tool, okay? Well, yeah, but you'll know, tear the paper, yeah. okay? How many and how many how many pieces of paper can you put in that one, or on in this one, or whatever? I mean, you're trying to clamp things together. It turns out if you read the history, and it will be the chapter in here will be posted if you want to read 26 pages on paper clips. Uh, the history of paper clips, it turns out, says from pins to paper clips, and there's 26 pages on it. Um, and some of the designs come, go back over 100 years, about 150 years. Why didn't we have paper clips before 150 years ago? No, we had paper. The Egyptians had paper, papyrus and stuff. But it was thing, one thing that we didn't have. You're right, steel. We didn't have cheap steel. In the old days, like 400 years ago, if you used steel nails to put together a barn or a house, when the house got old and the wood was rotten, you would burn the house down and sift through the ashes to recover the nails because the nails were so valuable. Okay? Well, now we don't worry about the cost of nails, right? And that gives you some idea of how we've increased the productivity of steel. It was Henry Bessemer in 1856 who taught us how to make steel economically, and then Andrew Carnegie became the richest man in the world doing it. Um, and the railroads came about because all of a sudden we had steel at a reasonable price. They had railroads before that, but it was all cast iron rails, and you couldn't put anything very heavy on a cast iron rail because it would break, okay? Steel wasn't as, as fragile. So I'd like you, and if you want, uh, it's not something you'll be graded on, uh, but if you'd like to make some notes of what do you think the parameters were, they did have, if you read, read the title that I put up there, that chapter four, from pins to clips. They did have steel pins, needles, okay? But that was just a short piece of steel because steel was so valuable. And they got to the point where now they had steel, a ductile material, a lot of the pins. I mean, Professor Hostler will show you pins that the Incas made or the Mexicans made, you know, five or 6,000 years ago out of metal. Uh, and they would clip, they would pin things together. Anybody ever tried to pin a couple of pieces of paper together with a safety, well, not a safety pin, but a straight pin? Yeah, kind of, you can need blood, okay? I mean, pretty easy to stick yourself, right? And when you read the patents for the paper clips in the 1860s, you're gonna find, oh, this was one of the advantages. You wouldn't, you know, that was why it was patentable to do something as simple as a paper clip. So you can go from the, uh, the pyramids to the paper clips in all kinds of different degrees of complexity. Um, and there are thousands of designs of paper clips today, some of which have almost no paper clipping utility, um, but are more for art. Okay? Well, that brings up the question what is the purpose of the design? Are you trying to be artistic? 
Here's the little bunny rabbit. Okay. You want a bunny rabbit? There you go. There's a bunny rabbit for you. Okay. Um, um, but you can look at these things and say, well, what is it about the design? And I may ask the class, what are the two fundamental mechanical properties that are necessary for making a functional paper clip? How about that? Huh? Stiffness. Stiffness or modulus, yes. See, I was going to ask the class, and let, but that's okay. That's one of them. What's the other one? Anybody know? It's strength, okay. You've got to have both strength and stiffness. If you look at the formula for bending of a, of a beam, which is basically what a pepper clip's doing. Um, well, actually, it might be three, but it's, it's basically strength. It's the modulus times the moment of inertia, E times I. If you ever had a mechanics class, and you can have some constant over here and stuff, but your ability to have bending strength is the modulus E, Young's modulus, times I, the moment of inertia. I got some mechanical engineers shaking their head over there like I'm right, right? At least you're not going back and forth, okay? Those are the two fundamental properties. Now, the moment of inertia will have in it, can have in it, the yield strength of the material. So you, you want to have ductility, that's why you want steel rather than cast iron, but you also want to have strength. And so some of these are heat treated for strength because steel can give you tremendous strength. Okay, so that, that increases the cost. What's the Achilles, Achilles heel of steel? If you take my material selection, it's corrosion. So some of them are plated with zinc so they won't corrode. The first paper clips would get the paper rusty. Okay, so there's lots of things to consider in design, even in small-scale design. Petrosky made his reputation in the beginning with a book, a whole book, about the pencil, okay? And the history of making pencils. And he goes back hundreds of years and whole chapters on making the lead. Because I think some, I didn't read the book. I'm, like, I'm going to spend time reading a whole book on pencils. Okay. Um, but he became famous, okay, as a professor of civil, civil engineering writing a book about the history of pencils. And there's some interesting engineering aspects as you go through the history to see how things um, happen. Petrosky also wrote a, wrote a book that this book, sorry, the, the one that got him elected to the National Academy of Engineering, okay, because he was sort of a historian of engineering. Uh, it wasn't because he was a great civil engineer, it's more he was a historian and a spokesman for engineering, is this one, To Engineer as Human, The Role of Failure in Successful Design. I think I've said before that engineering is design, okay? Design is a fundamental component of the uh, um, uh, field of engineering. And, um, Petrosky wrote this around 1990 or early 90s, um, saying that, well, we progress because we make something bigger or faster or lighter um, or cheaper, and we all of a sudden have a major failure. Okay? Anybody know the story of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge? Most people have seen Galloping Gertie, the bridge that kind of twisted and everything. I mean, not everybody has a camera there back in the 1940s take a picture of this thing, uh, but uh, Galloping Gertie was a bridge and they basically didn't have enough stiffness. They made a long suspension bridge that was very slender. This would be the roadway. Okay, you got a suspension bridge with the cables up here holding this thing. And if you go look up on Google the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, you can see that 1940s movie. And this was very, very thin. You go look at that and compare it to any other bridge, like the Golden Gate Bridge or the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. One of the things they did after, this was actually the second failure, they basically put some stiffening webs underneath to increase the bending strength so they wouldn't get into the resonance. And there's all kinds of stories about why exactly did the Tacoma Narrows Bridge fail? And even today, I'm not sure there's any consensus, whether it was resonant vibrations or whether it was just stiffness. Certainly stiffness, stiffening it solved the problem, 
But what really induced it? They had high winds coming up this channel uh, you know, of the river and stuff. Uh, that could be a, a topic of why did the T Tacoma Narrows Bridge fail? Asking a little bit deeper question than just the simple, it wasn't stiff enough. Um, so, um, any questions on that? So engineering can be the design of some of the simplest things like paper clips to some of the most complex things and things that involve millions of slaves or laborers or whatever, certainly millions of, today millions of hours of labor costing billions of dollars. Very complex things to very simple things. Um, now I want to go to, explore, if you don't have any questions, no questions? You guys aren't asking very many questions. Yes? Has shifted more towards emerging economies and this kind of uh, developed countries, they are not making so much steam nowadays. Even though oh, the developed countries are. Yeah. Not the, de the developing countries are, yeah. and the developed countries are not making as much steel. Yeah. Um, well, the simple answer is labor rates. Gordon Ford, who actually is a graduate of this department, who was owned, he was CEO of a mini mill. He's retired now. He's a Canadian, but he's living in Southern California. Um, he looked at it and he said, he looked at the Koreans, and they were making steel in the 1970s and the Chinese, the Japanese were, but they had higher labor rates. But the Koreans were the low cost steel producer at the time in the 1970s. And it cost $30 a ton to ship steel across the ocean. Steel or anything else, okay? The labor rate to go across the Pacific Ocean or the Atlantic Ocean is approximately $30 a ton, okay? So Gordon used to say if he could get the labor cost to making steel in the United States below $30 a ton, he didn't care if they, if they uh, made the steel, for, you know, um, if they paid their laborers nothing, he could still compete in selling steel in the United States. Let's face it, the United States is still 30% of the world's economy. And this is where everybody wants to dump their automobiles, everything, okay? Uh, appliances, you name it. Um, this is, if you can't sell to the United States, you're not gonna become a world world beater in terms of sales. You could be a nation beater in your own nation, but you gotta be able to market in the United States. We're the big, we're the 800 pound gorilla market. So, and you have to remember that in 1974, when I started at Bethlehem Steel, 40, 45% of the cost of a ton of steel was the raw materials, uh, the, the coal, the iron ore, and the limestone to make the steel. And then all the energy that went into it to process it. 45% was labor rates in the United States and 10% was profit. By the 1980s, it was down to probably 80% for raw materials um, and 30% for labor and minus 10% for profit. And that's why people like Ned Thomas says, oh, metallurgy's uh, dead, okay? Because the steel companies were losing money in 1980. By um, 1990, though, the steel companies were starting to make money, except for the, uh, what they had done is they had doubled their productivity. If you look at the U.S. steel employment, um, the employment in steel making in the United States was half a million people in 1980. In 1990, it was 250,000, but the consumption was constant at 100 million tons. Well, guess what? If consumption is constant, and productivity and um, employment goes down by a factor of two, what happens to productivity? It goes up by a factor of two. And so in fact, the problem in the steel industry and the metals industry in general in the 1980s is productivity was, was going way ahead of anything else. Nationwide productivity increase in the 1980s was one or 2% a year. In the, in the metals business, it was four to 5% a year. There was one other industry that beat the metals industry in the 1980s, mining. And you think Ned Thomas thinks much of mine, mining? I mean, that's the same as household gardening. You know, you go out and plant tomatoes. For, for, he can't tell the difference, okay? Um, so the, the thing is, those, those, uh, 
those industries, I'm giving you the long-winded answer, which is actually in one of my other modules, okay, but who cares, a little, you ask a question, so I answer it. What happened is in the 1960s and the 1970s, well, we developed two processes. One is, was an improvement on the old black, uh, basic open hearth. And this is, which, which lecture would this be in? This probably is in my uh, material selection lecture, okay? Set of, set of lectures. But the basic open hearth, it took 24 hours to make 400 tons of steel by blowing air over it to oxidize away the carbon, okay? Well, some guys in, in uh, Austria, yeah, 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 yeah. So the LD firm in Austria in the 1950s said, hey, why don't we blow pure oxygen on the steel rather than air, and we can oxidize it faster. Well, they got the, the time down from 24 hours to one hour, and now it's down to about 20 minutes to make 300 tons of steel as opposed to the old open hearths, 24 hours, U.S. Steel built, built a huge open hearth in the 1970s with 450 tons. Everybody else was going to the basic oxygen process, which was pure oxygen. Well, that was a tremendous increase in productivity. The other thing was continuous casting. When you make an ingot or pour an ingot of steel, it's usually slightly V-shaped. Anybody know why the mold is slightly V-shaped? So you can get it out. As it shrinks on solidification, you end up with a gap here and turn it over or lift it with a crane and you can take it out. You put it in straight-sided walls, you're liable to just, you just made a composite, okay, of cast iron and steel. So they have sloping walls, but anyway, you pour the steel in up to here, but as it shrinks on solidification, you get what we call a piping defect. It's just the shrinkage on solidification. You could throw away one-third of your steel and just remelt it because of the solidification piping. Well, what people learned to do, the Japanese primarily, took a while to do it, you had to invest hundreds of millions of dollars to do it. They basically developed a continuous casting technology, so you were constantly feeding liquid in here, and they have had continuous casters. These things are about 10 stories tall. You pour the steel in at the top, you have these copper molds that take the heat out, and they're about 10 feet high, and you just let the thing drop okay, pull it down, and the steel is soft enough, and if you've got seven stories to go, you can actually turn that 10-inch 10, 10 thick slab of steel sideways, horizontally. You can cut it off as the whole thing is moving at a few centimeters a minute, okay, it's not moving that fast. And the Japanese have cast continuously for several years off one machine. Now, if you have a breakout, which is if the liquid coming out the bottom Actually, the liquid, you still got liquid in the center of these little shell of solid steel. If that breaks and fractures, you dump 300, um, only not 300 tons, you dump a couple hundred tons of steel on top of your hundred million or billion dollar facility, and it shuts you down for a few weeks, which is pretty expensive. So breakouts are important, but that went, we basically went from 65% yield, pounds of steel poured, to pounds of steel sold, when I started Bethlehem Steel, ingot technology was 65%. Continuous casting technology was over 90%. Wow, what an increase in productivity, right? Well, because of the BOF and continuous casting, steel productivity went through the roof in the 1980s. And all of a sudden, when you have that much productivity increase, the world's using more steel, but they're not using, when you're going up at four or 5%, and the growth rate of steel is only 2%, you now have an excess capacity. And if you have excess capacity in all your plants, what happens to your price? Okay? Okay, so all of a sudden the steel companies were losing money. Wall Street thought steel was a dog, just like Ned Thomas. The people on Wall Street are just as stupid as Ned. Okay? They can't look at what the cause is. They just look at the effect and say, that's a bad effect. Okay, they're losing money. Why were they losing money? There was this guy, Mittal, in India, who was smart. And he knew there was value in steel. And he started buying up steel companies around the world, okay, cheap, like 10 cents on the dollar. And finally, in the 1990s, or 
actually around 2000, the, the worldwide steel excess capacity got consumed by increased consumption, tearing apart old plants that were unprofitable, and all of a sudden, by 2005, ArcelorMittal is now making a fortune because he knew, and anyone who had a half a brain, would have known that the world needs a billion tons of steel a year. That's a lot of market. And when you don't have excess capacity and you have high productivity, today the, um, actually part of my lecture on some of this stuff is I estimate that when they had Saugus Iron Works up here in 1600, up here in Saugus, Massachusetts, it's an interesting story on all of that, how they had one of the energy cri world energy crises in Britain was they were running out of wood. But they had discovered North America, and we had lots of wood in 1600. And so they sent their iron making over here, because you had to have a wood. And I estimated it took 4,000 person hours, okay, or 2,000 or 4,000, I don't remember, um, to make a ton of steel. Today it takes 15 minutes to make a ton of steel, person hours. Okay, well, how many industries can you name where you had that kind of productivity gain? Okay, so productivity is everything. Well, actually, Paul Krugman says productivity isn't everything, but it's nearly everything. Okay, uh, exchange rates and other things get in there too. Um, so did that answer your question? See, if you ask a question, I'll give you an answer. Only took 10 minutes. What was the question? The question is, why did the developing world, oh, actually, I didn't get to that part of this question. Why did the developing world do all the steel making? That's another interesting story. The, last, the world's last integrated steel mill. Uh, actually, anybody ever heard of the book, The Innovator's Dilemma? No? Clayton Christensen up at Harvard Business School 10 or 12 years ago uh, published this book called The Innovator's Dilemma, where he looked at technology advancements, and one of them was the steel industry. And uh, my daughter, who was in, I guess she was either in high school or she was in college, but she worked for Clayton one summer as a researcher, and she was working on the steel chapter for him, and he wanted to know what it cost to build an integrated steel mill. Integrated steel mill is one that has basic oxygen furnaces and blast furnaces and coke ovens, turns out five or 10 million tons of steel a year, which is multiplied by three or $400 a ton, uh, times five million, and you get a fairly fairly large number in terms of sales out of that one plant. And Rebecca came home one day and said, Dad, I can't find the cost anywhere. I've looked all over, can't find anywhere where it tells me how much to build, to make a, build an integrated steel plant. I said, I got that data. I got a slide on it, Rebecca. And uh, so I brought, came, got, came in, got my slide, gave, made a copy of it, gave it to Rebecca. And I had estimated $15 billion. Now, I estimated this sitting in an airport in Saginaw, Michigan with one of my graduate students, um, and we compared the cost of mini mills and integrated steel mills, and there was a new type of thing that Gordon Ford was promoting called micro mills that wouldn't buy so many huge lumps, like five or 10 million tons. And it turns out the, the last company in the world to build an integrated steel plant was Bethlehem Steel, the company I worked for. In 1965, they built the Burns Harbor, Indiana plant for $5 billion, okay? And they almost went bankrupt, because $5 billion in 1965 was a huge sum. It'd be like 15 or $20 billion today. An investment like that can bankrupt a company. It almost did for Bethlehem Steel. By 1974, they were making more money than they ever had, because they now had a modern facility. Same thing for Intel. What's the cost of building a silicon fab? 15 or 20 billion dollars. What's it cost Boeing to design a new aircraft? 15 or 20 billion dollars. What does it cost Pratt and Whitney or General Electric to dev develop a new jet engine? 10 or 15 billion. These are bet your company investments. And so very few companies in the world can or are willing to do that. All the new steel mills since 1965, there have been a, not, a lot of integrated steel mills built but they were built by countries, not by companies, okay? The Koreans built, they, they became the world's largest steel company. Okay, I was the POSCO professor. I went over there in 1999, had to give lectures to them about the steel industry. They had surpassed US Steel. US Steel sold them the technology. They built it, but it was the Korean government that was financing it, okay? 
Who's the largest steel company in the world today? Nope. Bao Steel, B-A-O. The Chinese. Again, who finances that? The Chinese government. ArcelorMittal, I think, is number two. But ArcelorMittal is a conglomerate of like 15 of the companies that existed in 1970. It was just Mittal was smart enough to go around and buy them up. I don't know who gave him the money, but he went around and bought them up. And he's a rich man because of it. Okay. So you got to look at what's fundamental. That decade's profitability, steel was losing money all over the country, all over the world in 1980s. And so all the, all the highbrows in Wall Street and Ned Thomas among them, not that he was a Wall Street highbrow, they determined that profitability was the answer to whether a, a, bit, a material was, business was a good business. Well, you know, you just have to get rid of the excess capacity. You have to look at the fundamentals of are they productive. Anyway, there's, there's more to, you can't live by sound bites. You actually have to understand something about the business. Okay, answer that, now I have, have answered that question, okay? Um, and the labor rates are still an important part of some of that stuff. But really, it's the developing countries. No, steel is such a fundamental material. If they're going to grow big, they look at the example of Japan. Japan has no steel making left at the end of World War II. We had bombed it all out. But the country helped build the steel companies again. And they had better steel technology than the United States by 1985. I, I took my sabbatical over in Japan in 1985 to learn about Japanese steel technology. The US Navy sent me over there because they wanted to build better, better ships. Okay, And I visited steel plants to see how they were doing it. All they were doing was using the technology that had been developed at some of the American steel companies in the 1950s and the 1960s, but never got commercialized because those companies didn't have the foresight Okay, among them, and that's another story about the management. Anyway, okay, but that's in some of the other lectures. Uh, any other questions before I start on what I was going to talk about? Okay, I was going to talk about another definition that helps to define the difference between science and engineering. Science seeks to increase human knowledge, engineering seeks to improve the human condition. And I think if you go back through what we've been talking about the last four, three or four lectures, you can kind of get those those themes out of there. But with that in mind, there is an engineering code of ethics. Okay, um, I've never heard of a, uh, in, well, in medicine, there's a code of ethics called the Hippocratic Oath. And what's the Hippocratic Oath? Do no, first do no harm, right. Um, in engineering, there is a code of ethics. The National Society of Professional Engineers has a code of ethics. I guess I'm going to get this in some area where you can read it. Um, and if you start looking at this, engineers uphold and advance the integrity, honor, and dignity of the engineering profession by, first, using their knowledge and skill for enhancement of human welfare, being honest and impartial, striving to increase the competence and prestige of the profession, so we'll make more money. Okay. Supporting the professional technical societies of their disciplines. Well, let's support all the people who fund us. Um, but I have never heard of a scientist's code of ethics or mantra like, do no harm for the medical doctors. That's why there's mad scientists and not mad engineers. But I, scientists have the attitude that they are doing something fundamental and everything is based on what they're doing and society should fund them no matter what they want to do. So, uh, for example, um, <clears throat> actually this was an engineering person who said this. I was giving a talk to some MIT alumni and another professor who uh, rose fairly high up into the administrative ranks at MIT. She was, I, I think she was a junior faculty member at the time, this was 25 years ago, and she was talking about going to Mars, okay? She was an aero and astro professor. And she said, the United States spends $20 billion a year on, computer, on, on, on potato chips. And we estimate going to Mars will only cost $20 billion. Well, whenever you first hear about the cost of some new material, okay, or some new project, $20 billion, they couldn't go to Mars in 20 years at $20 billion a year, okay? Give me a break. But I leaned over to the person next to me and I said, if you ask the American people, whether they'd rather give up their potato chips 
in order to go to Mars, I'll bet you if you had a boat, we'd still have potato chips. Okay? And that's the difference in the attitude of the scientist. I've seen it for years. They say, you need to give us more money. But what are they going to do with it? And you hear this debate all the time. And sometimes the politicians come in and say, what are we getting for our money? And the scientist says, oh, we're getting new knowledge. Oh, good. What am I going to do with that? OK. OK, the fundamental can canons of engineering um, are engineers hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public in the performance of their duties. If I'm working for a company and I find they're doing something that could be dangerous, I have, as a professional engineer, a duty to blow the whistle, OK, on something that's unsafe. OK, engineers shall perform their services only in the area of their competence. Well, that would be good if they would do that. Um, engineers shall issue public statements only in an objective, truthful manner. You know, don't talk to the media. Um, engineers shall act in professional manners, blah, blah, blah. You know, you'll get all this. These are the seven fundamental canons, or yeah, seven shall continue their professional development throughout their continuing education. Okay, This will be posted so far as that goes. Um, I actually did have, I think, oh, Jerry wasn't in. So anyway, well, I'll leave that up. Anyway, so there's, if you read what the engineers say about what their responsibilities are, it's to serve the public. I don't see the scientists saying our duty is to serve the public. Their duty is to increase knowledge, if you read the definitions of the scientists, OK? So let's take a look at some of the undergraduate degrees in the, in the country or the world. The United States, this is undergraduate degrees, 1997 or most recent. This is because the National Science Death Foundation did a study in about 1999. That's where this data came from. The United States produced 1.2 million undergraduate degrees, which was one third of the 24-year-old population. OK. Um, India, 5%. Japan, 28%. You go down through here. Um, and so we have a lot of educated students. But are they being educated in engineering? Uh, not necessarily in the United States. This is, um, but anyway, let's look at this first before I go to the engineering. Canada actually has the largest percentage of 24 years old, 24 year olds getting a, a degree college degree, Australia, then the United States, OK? And you go down and look at that. Now, if you look at engineer, engineering degrees, this was at a time Congress was pushing the NSF to have a National Engineering Foundation, OK? Not a National Science Foundation. Undergraduate bachelor's degrees in engineering worldwide, 866,000 a year, 13.8% of all the bachelor's degrees, so one in seven bachelor students is getting some sort of engineering degree. China, 45% of all the bachelor students in China are doing engineering, OK? The United States, 5%, 1 out of 20. The United Kingdom, 1 out of 10, OK? If you look at the actual uh, percentages of who, who does the most, the United States is not even on the main list, OK, with our 5%. Most other countries, engineering is uh, a larger fraction of the um, bachelor's degrees. Why is that? Yeah? Well, I would think culturally, and I'm only thinking about China, it's more acceptable. Like more people, almost everyone in our generation goes to college. And a lot of those people get like business degrees or arts or English, right. and that's more socially acceptable. Yeah, I don't know if that's that's right. part of the answer. Yes, that's actually made the main part of it. Yes, we're going to say in countries that do more manufacturing, you need more engineers to support that. Yeah, but a lot of the design engineering is done here in this country. But a lot of the designers are people that we imported from other countries, right? So Donald Trump, when you want to cut off all the immigration, well, he didn't say when it cuts off all of it. Some of the best engineering in this country is done by people who immigrated to this country from other countries. OK? Look around the room. OK? Um, it's not all white Anglo-Saxon Protestants or whatever anymore. 
where are they going? Well, you could think of it in terms of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We have a country that's one of the richest in the world, and many people, many of our parents, went to college. You go to Mexico, not very many of the parents went to college. You go to India, not very many of the parents went to college. MIT, when they compare themselves to Harvard, say, we are, or Princeton or Yale, we have a larger fraction of our undergraduates that are first generation college educated. And that's because engineering is sort of an egalitarian major where you can, if you're willing to work hard, and engineering has a reputation at most universities as being a hard discipline, okay? If you're willing to work hard, you can get through it, become one of the first ones in your uh, family to be educated, whereas if your parents went to college, they may want, they have enough money to send you to college and they may want you to become a music major, okay? Not me, I want all my kids not to be major, music majors. I said they could do that as an advocation. What happens to a, at the master's level? Well, you can go on and get a master's degree in engineering or you can get an MBA. Both of them take two years. One of them you have to go get some work experience usually. Um, you, get, um, you get out of the MBA with 60 or 70, this is a few years ago, it's more like $100,000 in debt or $150,000 depending on the school. You'll get, and again, this is older, $55,000 or seventy-five dollars to $100,000 starting salary, which helps pay off the debt. What are your responsibilities? You're going to be working for an MBA, and they'll be making the decisions, whether they know anything about technology or not. Okay? So we have, because of our affluence, we don't have as many of our uh, American-born, raised uh, parents who had a college education. We go off to the arts and sciences because we're up on the higher end of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We got enough food. We got enough uh, security. Okay, uh, people who come from other countries who don't have those things, they want to go into engineering in part because they want to go back and help their country procure those things. Whereas if you've got enough of these things, or you can buy them, or you can hire other people in India to to do the software development or whatever, okay. Um, you'll go off and you'll work in the arts and sciences, okay? But engineers are interested in doing something that uh, usually it applies at the lower level of the uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Okay, I, Simone will be in here tomorrow and I'll be here on Wednesday. Why is the percentage